23, the bill stated you had to have 40 percent, 40 percent from the U.S. or free trade uh, countries. They cut that down to 20 in half. Again, in 2024, it goes to 50. They kept that at 20. 2025, 60. They kept that at 30. 26, cut it in half from 70 to 35. You can see the trend. This is what you hear me complain about all the time. They're admin trying to administer a piece of legislation they never passed. And I'm just waiting for them to get out of the, what, what do we have? Northern Northern right right now. Now. Exactly. Interim. The interim. Huh? Yeah, they're, they're an interim as far as they haven't filed to follow rules. They're operating under the interim right now because we can't sue them. As soon as they go into their final ruling, there will be somebody damaged. They can sue. We'll do an amicus brief and stop this craziness. This is what I'm dealing with. So when people say, why are you upset about your bill? The bill is well balanced. We're producing more energy than ever before. We're producing more energy in this country than ever before. And we can do the same with minerals that we have that we haven't even touched yet. So with numbers like these, it's frustrating that administration continues to try to water down the sourcing requirements for EV batteries, clearly stated in the IRA. Through guidance, the administration is attempting to cut the critical mineral sourcing percentage requirements in half, as we just showed you. Pretending battery component manufacturing is the same as critical minerals processing and proposing fake free trade agreements that circumvent the law. And the administration still has not published a foreign entity of concern. Guidance required to the IRA, in the IRA to prevent bad actors from receiving taxpayer dollars. The chart, as, as we said, a stark difference behind me was between the strong critical mineral sourcing requirements explicitly spelled out in Section 13401 of the IRA and Treasury's attempt to lower the bar through guidance. As you can see, Treasury is effectively cutting the requirements in half, making it harder to secure the supply chain here at home with, uh, and with our partners. The administration appears to care more about getting EVs on the road than our energy security and competition with China. With so many of our mineral resources on federal lands, I appreciate uh, Deputy Secretary Boudreau joining us to discuss the Interior Department's role as part of the solution. While Congress has given the administration tools to secure our supply chain in recent legislation, I'm incre incredibly frustrated that the bipartisan demand for urgency seems to be going unheard. Benchmark mineral intelligence estimates that at least 336 new mines are needed for graphite, lithium, nickel, and cobalt to meet EV demands prior to 2035. However, an insufficient number of new mines are currently in development to meet that demand, while those projects that are under development face long time frames and considerable risk. When we refuse to allow mining and processing here in timely fashion, we encourage it to occur in countries with lower environmental and labor standards than we were permitted at home. No one in the administration or Congress denies this reality. Personally, I've been speaking to members in the Congo who are basically being exploited, and they are desperately in need of changing how they do business there and China having a stranglehold on them. And they're willing to fight, but it's going to be very hard. But we haven't seen any major projects approved by the U.S. Forest Service or the Department of Interior at any point during this administration. What we have seen is environmental impact statements for mineral projects rescinded to undergo years of additional review and consultation with no end in sight. Other projects, including one that has received Defense Production Act funding so that the Department of Defense can manufacture desperately needed ammunition, have seen their schedules slip over and over again. And we've heard troubling reports that Department of Energy grant funding is being withheld for mineral processing that would enable new mining, while recycling projects already have their cash in hand. Not only has the administration delayed the minerals projects that we need, they appear to be taking the position that we don't have a permitting problem at all for critical minerals. The bipartisan infrastructure law directed the Department of Interior to make critical mineral permitting improvements and then report back to Congress within one year on progress and additional recommendations. But instead of getting the report, the law requires the report we received earlier this month, 10 months late, does not describe any concrete actions that have been taken to speed up permitting or establishing timelines as required by the bipartisan infrastructure law. While I do not support the intent of some of the administration's non-permitting recommendations, like the reasonable reforms to the mining law of 1872 to ensure a fair return for taxpayers and addressing abandoned hard rock mines, none of that does anything to secure the supply chains for minerals or for the EV batteries that this administration so desperately once. It's seeming more and more like this administration's strategy is focused on talking about new mining, 
but doing very little to actually permit and use resources we have beneath our feet. I'm committed to keep working on a bipartisan basis in our committee to correct this course. We must also acknowledge that while we can provide much of the minerals that we need domestically, we can't produce or process every mineral in the quantities that we need here in the United States or even just in North America. So we need to ensure that we are working with trusted, reliable partners when it comes to overseas mineral sourcing. That means looking to friends like Canada and Australia, free trade partners, and our NATO allies to help us secure our mineral supply chains. But it does not mean ignoring our democratic values, labor standards, or environmental priorities to buy from anyone willing to sell us minerals or batteries. In closing, if we don't address our dependence problem and look for innovative ways to onshore the critical mineral supply chain, it will compromise our energy security and handicap us in a global marketplace. Let me be very clear. The reason the bill was written the way it was, I didn't want to give 75 cents credit to EVs, to the car makers. I think they have a good product, the market will go. That's where the market will take you. But in order to do that, we made a compromise. If we can develop our own supply chain, not dependent on China and areas of the world that we have no values with whatsoever that can hold them hostage the same way that, that Putin has held energy as a hostage and a weapon, then I would be happy to work with you. I tried in good faith to do that. And we have a bill that we all passed, this law passed. And it's a good piece of legislation that they do not wish to adhere to because it's not the time frame that they wanted. That's the problem I've got. So I'm going to continue to fight. And we can't let this happen. And with that in mind, I cannot help but take the opportunity with the Deputy Secretary to bring up the Inflation Reduction Act's oil and gas leasing provisions. I've been concerned about the efforts of the administration to throttle back oil and gas leasing and production. So I made sure that the IRA tied in tiers ability to issue wind and solar leases to the department holding significant oil and gas lease sales both on and offshore, simply stating, you can't go out and do what you want unless you do everything that we need. We're going to basically be able to extract the oil and gas that we need in the properties and basically our BLM land and offshore basically with the Gulf and do that as we're basically developing the resources that we need for minerals. As we all know, not only are we nearing the end of the fiscal year on September 30th, we are coming up on two major oil and gas deadlines. The release of the long-delayed five-year offshore leasing program and the Inflation Reduction Act's final mandate, Gulf of Mexico lease sells 261. Unfortunately, as a result of the administration's own actions, they've managed to delay the lease sell 261 until no later than November 8th, according to a recent Fifth Circuit order. Let me review just how ridiculous this is. First, the administration allowed environmental groups to hijack the leasing process by agreeing to a voluntary settlement related to the Rice's well that bypassed Interior's normal procedure and set them up to lose in court. <clears throat> the settlement imposed new restrictions on oil and gas in the Gulf and would have removed 6 million acres from the lease sale. Then, when the federal judge determined Interior's changes to the lease sale were likely unlawful and ordered the sale to proceed as originally proposed, Interior said they did not have enough time to course correct and meet the September 30 deadline set by Congress. Why not? Because according to Interior, they need more time to follow normal procedures, the same procedures that the administration was willing to bypass to appease environmental activists in the settlement agreement. You can't make this crap up. You just can't. It's real. This is just the latest example in which this administration hasn't gotten the message. Trying to rewrite an energy security law passed by Congress through administration action is not a winning strategy, and they're finding out the hard way, and they're delaying everyone's production. I want everyone to know that I will support anyone who suffers damages as a result of this administration failing to implement the IRA in alignment with the intent and the letter of this very balanced law. Because the reality is, we'll get closer to achieving our shared goals, not Republican goals, not Democrat goals, but American goals <coughs> for oil and gas, for critical minerals, and for many other energy sources, if we embrace the balanced approach in the IRA. As 10 of my Republican colleagues stated in their amicus brief, related to the lease sale 261, and I have said this, that bill that was put together, the IRA, was done with all the consideration working with my partners on the Republican side and Democrat side for over five years. The IRA was the result of that considerable deliberation concerning the economic, energy, environmental, and strategic interests of the United States, and the IRA balances diverse complex and overlapping considerations, including growth and con 
observation, domestic needs, and global positioning, and security and diplomacy. That was what my friends said. I couldn't agree more with my Republican friends on this, and I will continue to do everything in my power to ensure the law is implemented in that manner. We're already on track to realize the benefits of these energy laws that we have recently passed. We are producing, as I've said before, more energy of all kinds in 2023. 37 trillion cubic feet of gas will be produced this year, never before. 4.6 billion barrels of oil from the United States, never that much before. And doubling the amount of solar and battery projects, doubling the amount in one year, never done before. If we work on a bipartisan basis to implement all the above energy policy established by the IRA and the infrastructure law that we can build even more on the success. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today to understand how we can find a realistic path forward without sacrificing our energy and national security. And with that, I'm going to turn to Ranking Member, my friend, Senator Brasso. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, for your very strong statement on the importance of the hearing today and why we're holding the hearing. Because as a nation, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, we are highly dependent on imports of critical minerals and materials. Many of the countries that supply these resources are adversaries, and they clearly, as you said, don't share our values. Oh, a Biden administration official went so far as to call our mineral dependence a clear and present danger. And he met with the members of this committee just last week as we sat around to discuss the, the concerns that we share. That's one of the few statements from this administration that I agree with, because the projected mineral demand is increasing in an amount that is well known to all of us, and it doesn't seem to be understood by the administration. The world demand for copper is expected to increase by 300 percent by 2040. The Economist last week had an article about this. And where are you going to go for the copper? This administration has shut down a copper mine in northern Minnesota. So where are they going to go? Well, The Economist pointed out in their article, well, there is this place between the border of Iran and Pakistan that we can go to get the copper when we need the demand is up by 300 percent. Nickel demand is expected to increase by 1,900 percent. Graphite demand expected to increase by 2,500 percent. Lithium demand to increase by 4,200 percent. Much of this demand has been generated from President Biden's policies, compelling, mandating the use of electric vehicles, solar panels, and wind turbines. Look, the United States depends on imports for the vast majority of the minerals used in these products. China is a top producer of lithium and rare earth elements. Democratic Republic of the Congo is a major producer of cobalt and copper. And Indonesia, and Indonesia produces nearly half of the world's nickel. These nations don't share our values. China ruthlessly exploits a religious and ethnic minority as a source of forced labor in its mining industry. The Congo has tens of thousands of children mining cobalt. Indonesia is clear-cutting vast areas of its tropical rainforest to access its nickel reserves. No moral or ethical sacrifice, including slavery and child labor, seems to be too great for Joe Biden's so-called green transition. America's dependence on foreign minerals is not only shameful and reckless, it is unnecessary. We have more of the resources that we need right here at home, including copper, including lithium, including nickel, graphite, cobalt. Yet this Biden administration, boneheaded policies make it clearly impossible to access them. Recently, Mr. Chairman, scientists reported that the United States may be home to the largest known lithium deposit in the world. In fact, our nation's lithium reserves are estimated to be more than three times larger than China's. Yet China's lithium production is 27 times larger than ours. You can see it on the chart. Look at these comparisons, where we get things from and where they, where they exist. The two bar graphs show the lithium production and lithium reserves listed by country. We're number two in terms of availability. China is number two in terms of production. Even compared to countries with robust environmental standards, we are laggards. Australia has less than half of our reserves, but it produces 88 times more lithium than we do. This is ridiculous and unacceptable. The Biden administration seems gleefully intent on keeping us dependent on foreign minerals. It senselessly revoked leases for projects in Minnesota that would have produced nickel and cobalt for electric vehicle batteries carelessly revoked approval of a road in Alaska that was needed to develop copper, recklessly delayed a land exchange 
necessary for copper mine in Arizona. And it foolishly proposed withdrawing 10 million acres for mineral development in, across six states in the West, including Wyoming. If it weren't enough, this administration recently issued recommendations that would make it even harder to mine on federal lands. There is an interagency working group. It is headed by Mr. Bodreau, and it's, well, he's one of our witnesses today. And the working group wants to fundamentally change the mining claim system. It wants to add new fees and proposes more authority for the administration to withdraw lands from mineral production. Since many of our nation's mineral resources are on federal lands, the group's recommendations will mean less, not more, mineral production here in the United States and more dependence on our enemies. It's a disgrace. Look, said it before, Biden's agenda is not a transition from fossil fuels to sunshine and wind. It is a transition from American energy to foreign minerals. It is a transition from American strength and independence to American weakness and dependence. We must change this reckless course that we are on. We have abundant minerals and abundant energy resources here at home. We only need an administration with the courage and the common sense to use them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brasso. First of all, I want to thank all three of our witnesses for being with us today. I appreciate the efforts you made to be here, and we look forward to hearing from you. We have with us today the Honorable Tommy Boudreau, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior and Chair of the Interagency Working Group on Mining Laws, Regulations, and Permitting. We have Dr. Daniel Jurgen, Vice President, S&P Global, and we have Mr. Mark Compton, Executive Director, the American Exploration and Mining Association. Uh, so now we'll hear the remarks, and we'll start with uh, the Honorable Tommy Boudreau. Uh, thank you very much. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to provide testimony today on the administration's commitment to updating our mining policies and promoting sustainable and responsible domestic production of critical minerals. In addition to serving as the Deputy Secretary of the Interior Department, which oversees hard rock mining on public lands, I'm the co-chair of the Interagency Working Group on Mining Laws, Regulation, and Permitting. In many ways, today's hearing mirrors a conversation that Dr. Jurgen and I had in Houston earlier this year at the IHS CIRA conference, which was appropriately titled Big Shovels, Supplying the Minerals for the Energy Future. It's a pleasure to be with you again today, Dr. Jurgen. It's also a pleasure to join Mr. Compton from the American Exploration and Mining Association. Leadership from the mining industry is going to be essential to this effort. Earlier this month, the working group released its final report, which includes more than 60 specific recommendations to improve and accelerate the way we site, permit, oversee, and reclaim mines on public lands in the United States. This report is the product of President Biden's direction under Executive Order 14017 regarding securing America's supply chains and the bipartisan infrastructure law. The reasons for the President's and Congress's focus on mining reform are clear. Reliable and responsible sources for critical minerals, including lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite, are essential to the clean energy and technology revolutions that are shaping our future for the better. This working group's effort kicked off in May of last year with an unprecedented roundtable at the White House that for the first time brought together communities uh, including the mining industry, local governments, tribes, labor, federal and state partners, academics, and environmental advocates to have a serious conversation about how to meet our needs for these critical minerals while respecting local communities and keeping our lands and waters clean and safe. After hearing all of these viewpoints and receiving nearly 27,000 written comments from the public, the working group identified key changes that will help mine permitting become more efficient and improve our ability to produce our own domestic resources while better engaging and protecting communities impacted by potential mines, especially tribes and rural communities. The biggest takeaway from the report is that our 150-year-old law signed into law by President Grant for accessing minerals on public lands needs to be reformed to meet the urgency and standards of the 21st century. 
I'm not saying we need to rewrite the American mineral laws every century, but maybe every other century we should take a hard look at whether these laws are providing the tools we need to meet today's national security and economic imperatives for critical minerals. The 1872 mining law clearly does not do that. If we are to seize the opportunities for domestic sourcing of critical minerals, we need to employ the same tools that we have been so successful in standing up thousands of megawatts of renewable energy on public lands and offshore. This includes leasing programs that target resources while reducing conflicts with local communities, wildlife habitat, and essential water resources. Moreover, unlike companies that develop energy minerals like oil, gas, and coal from public lands, companies that mine for hard rock minerals pay no royalties to the American taxpayer. This is one of the reasons we do not have the funding necessary to address the estimated 500,000 abandoned hard rock mine sites that create safety hazards and pollute the land and water throughout the country. Recall the Gold King mine incident that turned the Animas River in Colorado orange in 2015. Moreover, important to addressing the prolonged permitting process in this country is the recognition that there is no way to incentivize companies to use their existing mining claims. It's common for speculators to stake claims and sit on them for decades with no intention of ever producing the minerals. The second biggest takeaway from the report is that the way the government and mining companies engage tribes and communities is often too little and too late. Mining companies may spend years and millions of dollars planning for a mine before the public is given details about the proposal and an opportunity to weigh in. This is a recipe for local opposition, lawsuits, and protracted permitting delays. Despite the need for legislative reform, which we will work with Congress on, we are taking on significant reforms uh, through the Bureau of Land Management as we speak. I look forward to discussing those reforms and answering the committee's questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boudreau. And now we have Dr. Jurgen. There, let me start again. Start. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, members of the committee, it's, a, it's an honor to be here to have a chance to talk with you about these urgent questions of minerals, which you've been discussing since 2021. Uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary Boudreau said, we're moving from that term that headline writers like big oil to big shovels, which means a lot more mining. And uh, I was thinking since you had your original hearings on minerals, there have been a number of alarming messages from international organizations, from governments, including the U.S. government, about the need uh, and the urgency <coughs> of uh, minerals. The IMF, for instance, has warned that pursuit of net zero emissions will spur unprecedented demand for some of the most crucial metals, leading to soaring costs and shortages that could derail or delay the energy transition. But how much will be needed? It sometimes seems like an abstract question, but one way to think about it is that the state of California has passed a regulation saying that every new car sold in the state of California after 2035 will have to have two and a half times more copper than uh, every car that's now uh, sold. Now, the regulations didn't say that, but they said that they're going to be EVs, and EVs use two and a half times more copper for every single car. You say the same thing with uh, offshore wind and so forth. So at, at uh, S&P Global, we've tried to examine what are the mineral requirements and have done it in our two studies that uh, the chairman referred to, the future of copper and then on the Reflation, Inflation Reduction Act and its impact on minerals. We came up with this idea of energy transition demand to, to differentiate. This is new consumption. Uh, consumption come from EVs, on and offshore wind, solar panels, charging stations, battery storage. And this is different from the traditional demand, which is, for instance, the electric wiring in your houses. So our key findings are what have already been described by both the chairman and the ranking member. We see uh, copper demand in order to meet the various goals out there having to double by 2035, and other mineral demands growing by 23 times uh, uh, for the United States. And securing these minerals uh, to meet demand will be challenging for all the reasons 
capacity, trade patterns, sourcing requirements, geopolitical tensions, and the long and complicated uh, lead times for permitting and judicial reviews for developing new mines. Yeah. So this will require an expanded uh, international and domestic supply base, realignment of trading patterns uh, uh, to go forward. Uh, those were our numbers before the IRA. Since the IRA, we went back and looked at the numbers again and said that the demand for the four minerals that we're talking about will each increase on top of that big increase by another 12 to 15 percent uh, to meet the demands that are laid out by the IRA. Um, it's also important to recognize that other countries will be competing for these resources. So at the same time, uh, the EU, uh, Japan, China, and other countries, and so this will further test the ability of the U.S. to get these resources. Uh, uh, the chairman uh, talked about the concentration. I think there are two important parts of concentration. One is the processing that's already been excite, uh, cited and the dominance of China in those numbers, 70% for nickel and cobalt, for instance. And then it's production. Uh, think about it this way as a comparison. Three countries produce 40% of crude oil, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Two countries produce 40% of copper. One of them is Peru, which has had seven presidents in the last few years. And the other is Chile, which is just in the process of nationalizing its lithium resources, which are considered at this point the largest in the world. And then there's a matter of the obsolescing bargain, which is governments, as prices go up, will renegotiate, drive up prices, and that will inhibit investment. I just want to say something now about permitting that's we looked at 127 mines that began production between 2022 and 20, 2002 and 2023. And it took, uh, if, based upon that, if you started a new mine today, you wouldn't see production till 2040. In 1956, the U.S. Bureau of Mines, which I believe part of the Department of Interior, said it would take three to four years to bring a new mine on in the United States. Today, it would take about five times as long to do that. So, uh, and we do have significant untapped resources, enough copper uh, to meet 20 years of demand that's uh, untapped at this point. So, uh, so much depends on what happens above ground in terms of permitting, in terms of regulation. So I think it's very clear from everything that's going on that the policy efforts to stoke uh, this energy transition demand for minerals will be very effective as the research shows. However, as you're doing with this committee, greater attention needs to be paid to securing enough supply to undergird these demand ambitions, both domestically and internationally. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And now we'll have Mr. Compton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Brasso, members of the committee, I want to start by thanking the committee for highlighting mineral security issues. Uh, as well as your work to create an environment in which the U.S. mining industry can succeed in safely and responsibly providing the raw materials our nation requires for our national defense, economic well-being, and, and energy security. Unfortunately, a lack of access to our mineral-rich federal lands and a lengthy, inefficient federal permitting system have resulted in our unsustainable dependence on foreign countries for nearly 50 minerals, and has empowered our adversaries to weaponize minerals against us. These supply chain concerns have led to bipartisan acknowledgement of the need for more domestic mineral production. Although we may, may need to obtain some minerals from our allies, we must responsibly utilize our own resources whenever possible. As Dr. Jurgen pointed out, this, the surging global demand for minerals means other countries will be competing for the same limited supplies challenging our ability to obtain minerals from abroad. Americans and the environment lose when we offshore our mineral requirements. It makes no sense to create mining jobs elsewhere, import minerals from countries with inferior environmental protection and worker health and safety standards, and to generate the CO2 by shipping minerals from faraway places. Because hard rock mineral deposits are rare geologic phenomena, it's imperative that mineralized lands remain accessible to mineral exploration and development. Mines can only be developed in those few places where economically viable deposits were formed and geologists have discovered them. We can't choose where they're located and we can't move them. More than half of federal lands are already off limits or severely restricted to mining. 
Further restricting access to mineral resources threatens our mineral security and chills investment. If we can't invest in mineral exploration, we can't discover that needle in a haystack deposit. According to the National Academy of Sciences, only one in 1,000 uh, prospects actually becomes a producing mine. Now, there are complex logistics of mining that cannot be changed. But what can be changed is putting the right policies in place to prevent unneeded bureaucratic hurdles to domestic production. And those policies include providing adequate land access and minimizing permitting obstacles. For the past 18 months, we work closely and in good faith with the Biden administration's interagency working group on mining regulations, laws, and permitting. We view the IWG process and development of its report as an opportunity to identify ways to eliminate some of the current barriers to discovery and developing minerals on public lands. Unfortunately, the recommendations in the IWG report related to the mining law will make exploration and mine development harder because they propose eliminating security of, of land tenure and burden future mines with a confiscatory royalty. Given the skyrocketing demand for minerals, now is an especially bad time to upend this law and implement such proposals. In a broader context, the IWG uh, report, BLM's proposed conservation rule, along with other administrative actions, will ultimately place more lands off limits to mining and ultimately increase our dependency on China and other countries for minerals. We applaud the important NEPA streamline am amendments uh, that were in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, but CEQ's proposed NEPA rules will only lengthen the NEPA process and spawn yet more litigation. The bipartisan interest in further permitting reform, uh, though, is very encouraging, and we look forward to, to future dialogue in this committee on Chairman Manchin's and Ranking Member Barrasso's permitting bills, mm -hmm. and in the Environment and Public Works Committee as well. Yeah. I'd also like to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for their leadership in boosting the mining workforce of yeah. the future by introducing the Mining Schools Act and this committee's uh, markup of that important legislation last week. So we look forward to working constructively with you to seize upon this generational opportunity to ensure that made in America includes mined in America and sourcing minerals from U.S. mines that use state-of-the-art environmental protection measures, put a premium on worker health and safety, and are committed to the communities in which they operate. I look forward to answering any of your questions. First of all, let me thank all three of you. I appreciate it very much. We'll start with our questioning now. I just have basically, uh, Dr. Jurgen, I respect because you've been all over the world. I run into you from different places too, but basically looking and seeing what the facts are and what we're dealing with. The pressure now with us coming on so strong with the demand for EVs, the way the administration is pushing our electric vehicles out the door quicker and not, not concurring to the law because they want to get more vehicles on the road, more dependency. How much of a strain is that putting on the world market and basically us being able to, to meet the demand coming from areas of, uh, of places? My, my thing, what I said, is that uh, I remember the 1974 oil embargo. I remember waiting in line to get my gas so I go to work. I remember all that. And I just said, I don't want to be waiting. I, <laughs> you were my instructor. <laughs> Anyway, uh, anyway, with that, I just said I don't want to wait in line to f my battery, any new battery or something for China to basically said whether I can drive my vehicle or not. That's all I was concerned about. I think it's a wonderful EVs are wonderful. People like them. They're great and all that, and you buy what you want. But we're incentivizing people, almost bribing them to buy them, and then putting them in a very perilous situation. Tell me what it's doing to the world market as you see it with, a, with it basically – uh, changes going on around the world. I've talked to the people in the Congo. They're they're t totally upset, but it's a different controlled environment. Tell me what you're seeing. Well, what's happening is basically trying to, you know, normally energy transitions take about 100 years, and this is trying to do one in 25 years, and that's never been done before, and it's putting pressure on the system. And that's why one of the things I wanted to emphasize that it's not just demand from the United States, but it's demand from elsewhere in the world that's happening at the same time. So it is going to put enormous pressure on the system, uh, and uh, you just don't see how the mining is going to catch up, the supply is going to catch up, and so that will mean... Uh, 
prices going up, it'll mean shortages. And then, as uh, has been pointed out by you and uh, uh, Ranking Member Barroso, uh, there is a real imbalance on how, particularly the processing of it. And, uh, and you know, it's just, it's unbalanced to, to do that. And it is quite concerning about just uh, how concentrated at this point the the supplies are just from a few countries. So I don't envision a sort of 1973 in the sense of a uh, collusion of countries, but you can imagine t very tight markets and, and shortages and a few countries being in a very tight control of supply. Yeah, Mr. Major, I, I know that you've been uh, through different administrations seeing basically the balances that need. I mean, you know, I've had conversations, you know, that I think we're out of balance of what we're producing and what we could produce and what we need. Uh, with that, the administration doesn't seem to have the urgency to try to get permits and try to basically make sure that we are able to to uh, provide our own resources here with the minerals that and deposits we have. What can we do to change that? What do you think really needs to be done for us to make a su substantial change yeah. in how we extract in America? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Chairman Manchin. First of all, um, share uh, all of the views expressed about the need to accelerate reliable and domestic sourcing of critical minerals. This is the fundamental work of the working group, uh, consistent with the executive order and with uh, the direction from Congress under the bipartisan infrastructure law. The trick is, and the hard work is, how do we actually accomplish that? There are some fundamental principles, even setting apart uh, legislative reform of the 1872 mining law. And that means proactive community engagement uh, in order to do deconfliction. This is why it takes uh, way too long to permit a mine in this country uh, because of, uh, of community conflict, because of litigation, uh, because of uh, a history of environmental impacts, including to tribes uh, that uh, that is still very much on people's minds. Um, second, communities need, as part of that, communities need to see the benefit of, uh, of uh, mining activity so that uh, communities don't feel imposed upon, but rather feel uh, invested in uh, these developments. So those are the types of administrative reforms uh, that I'm having conversations with the mining community about and also conversations uh, within the Bureau of Land Management on how we can implement administratively. I'm going to ask all three of you just one quick question as I'm wrapping up my time, is that um, the greatest obstacle do you think that we face and the most urgent thing need that we have, would you say it's permitting or do you have something else that you think that's basically impeding us from moving forward? Or permitting reform is the most critical thing we're facing. If not, we're not going to be able to meet not only the demands of the market, we're not going to be able to meet the ability for us to even implement any of the laws that we have right now to the fullest. Uh, Mr. Bajor, would I start with you, if you, how your feelings on that is permitting? I agree. One of the biggest challenges is permitting, uh, allowing for responsible mining to go forward. I think there are many examples where uh, there are responsible mines, including mines that have been permitted in this administration, such as lithium mines uh, in Nevada. And so it can be done. I'm fully confident. Uh, the timelines do need to be reduced. I, th I think that permitting and the judicial review that goes on is absolutely the biggest uh, obstacle. I mean, you realize that sometimes the permitting process will be half of a person's professional career. It can take that long. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also what that does to the ability to have capital available to uh, uh, undertake these projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, it, it's hard to disagree that of the about the importance of Nothing of more permitting. important than permitting. There, well, but... The, what I would point out is without access to mineral deposits first and the security of tenure to be able to know that if you find a, a you discover a deposit, you're going to be able to develop that, then permitting never even comes into play. Let me just say for the committee's sake, information, I want to compliment both of our staffs, on, the, on the, our Republican friends, on their staff on this side, Senator Brasso's and our staff on the Democrat side. They've been working diligently on permitting reform. And hopefully we are ho hope to bring something to the committee that you all can work on, because most of it's in our jurisdiction. We've been meeting with Senator Carper to a certain extent. He has some in his jurisdiction of, EP, uh, of EPW. 
we could surprise the world if we can get something done before the end of the year. And we're going to have, have some substantial, I think, recommendations, hopefully, towards that period. So we're, we're working diligently on this. We have the same conclusion you all have. Senator Brasso. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate all the cooperation that we've had as we work together on the permitting issues and the work continues. Uh, Mr. Compton. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, this interagency working group, they recently released, released a report that contains 65 recommendations. The recommendations include imposing new royalties and fees on mining, elimination of mining claim system that encourages resource exploration. All of these recommendations, if they adopted all of them, would they on balance increase or decrease mineral production on federal lands in America? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Member Brasso. I as I said in my opening statement, uh, you know, I think ultimately the IWG report, especially taken in, in context with other administrative actions, uh, will increase our reliance on, on China and other countries for our mineral needs. The, the report really is a, a mixed bag, I would say, uh, but there, the, the mining law recommendations in there, this is not the time to completely upend our system. Uh, the report even acknowledged in the report that uh, converting to a leasing system would cause significant delays in our clean energy objectives. So then, uh, Secretary Baudreau, uh, simple questions are not meant to be trick questions. You know, please, on balance, is it better to mine cobalt here at home or with child labor in the Congo? Of course it's better to have reliable domestic sourcing okay. for it, critical minerals. It, better to mine lithium here or at home or slave labor in China? Of course, it's better to have reliable supply chains for all of these critical minerals. It's better to mine nickel here at home or raising the rainforest in Indonesia? As I've said, yeah. uh, and is the purpose of the interagency's work, it is to uh, advance the cause of uh, developing reliable sourcing and supply chains for uh, a host of critical minerals necessary for clean energy and technology development. So then why is the administration and the secretary blocking access to minerals and making it more difficult, as we just heard, to mine them here at home. So I think as members of this committee know, I'm a serious person on these issues. Um, and having a lot of experience across uh, uh, energy projects as well as mining projects, fundamentally we need a system and we need um, to implement uh, reforms that uh, enable that type of development. The main barrier to uh, unlocking uh, America's resources here is uh, conflict uh, and litigation and uncertainty about uh, the permitting process. We need to take that on. That's what the report is intended to do. So the administration also has issued my mineral withdrawals, 26 mineral withdrawals or proposed mineral withdrawals in just the last two and a half years since taken office. January, the department withdrew 225,000 acres from a site containing 95% of our nation's nickel reserves, 88% of our nation's cobalt reserves, 34% of our nation's copper reserves. We're talking about withdrawals that the administration has done and the secretary sat here and seemingly took great credit for. The Biden White House has said that over-reliance on foreign sources and ad adversarial nations for critical minerals and materials pose national and economic security threats. Yet your Department of Interior continues to make it harder to develop the resources, and we have them right here at home. So how do these mineral withdrawals that your secretary came here and talked about, how does that help us reduce our nation's dependency on foreign minerals? So let's talk about where those withdrawals happen. So. Uh, as an Alaskan, uh, the right place to mine for some of these materials is not in the richest, most abundant uh, salmon fishery in the entire world. Um, as a um, supporter of uh, a host of economic activity, the right place to mine for some of these materials is not in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota, which is the biggest economic driver in that part of the state. And so these things do have to be viewed in context. Unfortunately, under the existing laws, the only blunt instrument available to the department, and this is why we need more tools, is something like a mineral withdrawal. We need to be able to have a much uh, f finer and targeted approach to the development of critical minerals. So, Mr. Compton, and then to Dr. Jurgen, 
Uh, we're developing only a small fraction of our nation's lithium reserves, especially compared to Australia. Is there any reason that why we should be so far behind uh, a nation with similar environmental and labor standards as we have with Australia? No, of course, there, there is absolutely no reason we should be, uh, you know, e even if we considered ourselves average in permitting with some of these countries, uh, I don't think it's... Uh, I don't think it's the United States' place to be celebrating being average either. So, uh, yeah, we, we have a lot of work to do on our permitting to, to get out ahead. So, Dr. Jurgen, you know, how, how can we here at home drive up our mineral production to levels closer to Australia, specifically with lithium? Well, I, I think if we look at Australia and Canada, they have more efficient permitting processes and they get on with it and see it as, as important as opposed to, and they're both countries with a strong mining traditions, so they don't have the kind of uh, uh, divisions that we do. We do see, actually, of the four minerals that we've talked about, uh, over the th particularly three of them, the U.S. has the best prospects. Lithium is our best prospect to become uh, a, a bigger, a much bigger producer. We're, we're best positioned in that, we think. So, so, so my and, final and question... Seeing, I'm sorry. No, no. Well, just the chairman and I were just talking about the fact that how about the court systems and how it drags on? Because I think Mr. Bodro, Secretary... Baudreau just talked also about the litigation involved in slowing all of this down. Yeah, well, that's why I said it's not only permitting, but it's the judicial review that goes on and on uh, that is uh, unique to our system that makes it so difficult to do it. And even if you wanted to get going now, it's going to take time to, to get going. But when you look at 20 years to get a project going, uh, you know, that's we're talking about 2040, 2043. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm with you. Senator Hickenlooper, up early. I wouldn't go that far. Um, let me start with you, Mr. Boudreau. Um, Tommy, if I could be so bold. Uh, uh, Interior's work, uh, including the USGS mineral, critical mineral uh, list, helps inform a lot of the approach you're taking that our country's taking to s these critical uh, supply chain issues. How does the USGS information help other agencies as they work to try and enhance our our mineral processing capabilities, strengthen ties with our foreign allies on securing the materials we need for this clean energy future. And, you know, the bipartisan law included funding to map out our nation's critical resources. How is that work progressing from your point of view, and, and what benefits is that mapping going to provide? Thank you, Senator. I think it gets at an issue, an important issue that Mr. Compton raised about um, the locatability of these minerals. And so one way that uh, the Interior Department, the federal government, the USGS in particular, uh, can help is with the development of geologic information. Uh, that can inform both the permitting process as well as prospecting and provide certainty to the industry about uh, where there are high value resources and also potentially um, reduce conflict. And so I view that as incredibly important work and we are lucky to have uh, the USGS uh, as focused on it as they are and their work is uh, progressing very well. Great, thank you. And I'm not going to ask a question on this, but obviously Colorado has the Colorado School of Mines or a number of great mining schools out west and the chair and the ranking member have led on the Mining Schools Act. And obviously I think how we get the next generation of engineers and geologists uh, and make sure they're training them, we're recruiting them, training them, and, uh, and retaining them uh, is important. But I, I'm going to submit that in writing so I can get a chance to ask Dr. Jurgen a question. Hopefully I get to all three of you. Um, uh, Dr. Jurgen, Daniel, if I can be so bold, uh, you are uh, an expert in global oil production, and yet back in those dark days in the, in the 90s, we did, no one really foresaw or was able to predict the amazing innovations that uh, would take place that would take us from uh, a, sh a struggling producer to really the, the global leader. Um, and I guess my question is, is what, do, what do you see, what things can we be doing to push the innovation in our critical minerals? So whether it's through substitution, through its efficiencies, its you know, how do we find some way of achieving some of those? Obviously, we, you couldn't, no one, or very few people, you, you probably had some notions, but very few people saw that shale revolution coming. Are there other uh, revolutions coming in terms of copper and, and say, lithium? 
Well, the shale revolution uh, did come as a surprise, and it was transformative. It took us from being the largest importer of oil in the world to the largest producer of oil. It's uh, U.S. Uh, LNG based on shale is 40% uh, now of Europe's LNG supply, and it's been a very important answer to Mr. Putin. At this point, and I'm not a technologist, uh, but we don't understand, we don't see that there is some incredible breakthrough like the shale revolution that will, you know, really transform the mineral situation. But the two things that can, there's obviously an enormous amount of research going on on battery technology, uh, uh, also in terms of making mines more efficient and so forth. And then, it, you know, we will see as time goes on, recycling will become more important. But you're starting from a very small base in terms of doing that and just collecting and processing it itself is a major industrial activity. Yeah. I think when there's other opportunities like distributed energy resources, some of those investments will accelerate faster than people think. But I agree with you. I think that we, did, we haven't seen where those innovations are, but they're probably there. And I guess that at some point we're part of the role of this committee is to figure out how do we incentivize and, and make sure that we're Absolute, doing that. Absolutely. That, uh, you know, the, the research part of it is so important, and it may well come as a surprise. It's just that there's not anything obvious there, and that the time frame for mining is two or three times longer even than the time frame for oil and gas. Right. Uh, and Mr. Compton, and I'm going to make this, I'm going to leave out all the, the, the bulk. Um, you obviously understand business risk and, and what mining companies are, are facing, um, and that there's always uncertainty. Uh, when we're trying to uh, attract investment capital for some of these critical projects. Um, do you see the role, or do you see, do you see a role for the federal government to act as a kind of a market smoother, um, either through stockpiling certain uh, central minerals or through commitments to buy and sell if certain conditions are triggered so that we don't at least have the, the, the roller coaster effects that sometimes the markets create? Thank you, Senator. I, I think the federal government has the ability to be a, a market smoother just by reducing the uncertainty over how our mining system operates. Uh, perpetual threats, really, to upend our system when, as Dr. Jurgen points out, you know, you're, you're a good 20 years from exploration to being able to get ore out of the ground. If we're going to be able to meet those growing mineral demands, we have to incentivize exploration and production now. And from the investment community standpoint, like when they saw the, the interagency working groups report come out earlier this month, uh, I know one of our members who's a consultant said he spent three days on the phone with his clients talking them down off the ledge. Uh, you know, he was able to talk them down, but who, how many others in the investment community are we not able to get right. that message to? I appreciate that. And I've got more questions I'll submit in writing, but I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you all for, your, for being here today. Thank you. And I turn to our birthday boy today, Senator Bill Cassidy. Uh, some anniversary of 39. Uh, so anyway, um, Mr. Bodro, I'm from Louisiana. You know a question I'm going to ask you. How's our five-year leasing plan coming for um, oil and gas development in the Gulf of Mexico? Uh, we missed your birthday by one day. We'll be publishing the five-year program tomorrow. That's fantastic. And my birthday will be no inhibitions and no restrictions by the administration. That'll be the birthday present? <laughs> the birthday present uh, to Chairman Manchin uh, is that uh, the program is definitely informed by uh, the IRA. Uh, and the connection that the IRA makes between uh, offshore oil and gas leasing and renewable energy leasing. So then uh, staying on the ocean bed, Dr. Jurgen, the, um, you mentioned we need kind of this technological breakthrough in order to source these critical minerals. But I'm told the ocean beds are full of it and that we actually have the technology to mine off the ocean bed. And intuitively to me, if you're just scraping rocks off the bottom, uh, it is not the same as an open pit mine. Uh, are we anywhere close to uh, deploying that technology as a means to address this issue? 
I think it's very uh, early days. There are some companies that are working on it and have been pursuing it for a couple of years. A lot of minerals there, uh, but there'll be a lot of controversy as well about uh, scraping the, the bottom of the ocean, I think. Uh, there, there would be, but nonetheless, there's controversy about anything, right? Uh, so, um, so uh, Mr. Bodro, is there any effort by the administration to pursue the mining of minerals off the ocean floor? Um, so I don't want to open up a whole nother can of worms, which was, you know, a big knockdown drag out, uh, including during the Obama administration. But one area that would be helpful uh, is uh, law of the sea implementation, uh, which provides a framework for accessing. And I understand that we're actually resources. losing territory because of our delay in implementation or at least adoption of the treaty. But that if we adopted it, that could potentially open up the next version of the shale revolution to address our unmet needs. I think that's one of the reasons to adopt uh, the law of the sea treaty. Let me ask you, going back to lithium mines, and you say it'll take however, however long in order to permit, um, in, in the county in Arkansas that is that borders Louisiana, they are now mining lithium from the prehistoric ocean, which is below the smackover formation. Now, of course, I'm looking at that saying that that prehistoric ocean extends about 25 miles south into Louisiana. And so I'm interested in exploring that. Intuitively, and by the way, Exxon has just made a big investment there, so this is more than a conversation piece. It's money being staked. Uh, intuitively to me, if you're extracting from um, uh, deep down and you're processing above, that that is going to be less problematic in terms of permitting than if you have an open pit mine. Uh, knowing that I've given you a theoretical, but does that intuition um, sound good to you? And is there anything USGS could do to see if those um, uh, subterranean resources um, are, are viable? Yeah, and I think this goes to an earlier question of Dr. Jurgen. There is massive opportunity for technological development. Uh, especially with respect to uh, lithium. And so one of the efforts from, uh, so mining, sourcing, all important, um, but one of the main uh, and most promising lines of effort is technological development, both uh, brining, and there's a project we're working on in uh, Southern California focused <coughs> on uh, deriving lithium from uh, other activities. And I think the type of um, opportunities you're describing, while well, they require further technological development, are activities that should be uh, supported. But it seems as if this is already taking place. Again, they've been processing lithium out of this smackover formation in Arkansas for some time now. Uh, I think they may also be getting cobalt, but I'm a little bit kind of having to think about that twice. Um, so I just encourage that because I think in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we actually had dollars for USGS to go out and find more resources. And of course, I'd like them to find them in my state uh, for all the reasons, not least of which it would supply the rest of the United States with the needed resource. Yeah, I understand and agree. Lastly, in your analysis, uh, in your life cycle analysis of um, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, associated with new developments in the United States, do you take into account the life cycle um, uh, greenhouse gas emission profile of a project overseas? So, for example, if we're trying to supplant cobalt coming from the Congo that is used with child labor and goes to China where they use coal as primary feedstock for energy, um, yes, we may have a little bit of a footprint here, but it's substantially less than the life cycle of the other. Is that taken into consideration? Because sometimes it seems like we make the perfect enemy of the good. Yeah, so uh, agree completely that when you're looking at any particular project, um, viewing it within a global context is important. I think uh, one of the opportunities and benefits for more reliable uh, permitting of critical minerals in the United States is exactly what you described as reduced carbon footprint. Yeah, but again, are we comparing ourselves to that which we would be competing against, or are we comparing ourselves to some pure standard? Because it seems oftentimes that we're comparing ourselves to a pure standard, not recognizing that we, as somebody mentioned earlier, are actually doing it with the lowest carbon footprint in the, in the world oftentimes. Yeah, so in the realm of permitting critical minerals, while relevant, um, carbon emissions are uh, often uh, the less significant impacts compared to, uh, in particular, impacts on water resources. Yeah. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the ranking member for this important hearing. I thank you to all the panelists. I appreciate all of your comments. Um, 
Uh, I say this time and again, uh, Nevada, my home state, has 85% uh, of federal public land and has the largest mining program on public land in the country. It supports nearly 33,000 jobs uh, in the state. It's a key contributor to our economy. It's a social safety net for many uh, rural and remote communities in my state. So as we are having this conversation, we take the necessary steps to address climate change. I, I agree. We have to do so in a fashion oh, that makes America more productive, John. secure, and self-reliant. <clears throat> At a very basic level, this means we have to produce minerals in the United States and not solely rely on foreign sources. And I think we've all been talking about that. Here's my conundrum, and I'm hopeful I'm going to ask uh, the, the Deputy Secretary this first question. I understand the administration has this all-government approach to addressing uh, our future security needs when it comes to our clean energy, including as it uh, pertains to mining. But he here's my struggle. Just last week, the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Committee imposed new limits, or actually proposed imposing new limits, on eligible entities to be considered for the FAST 41 expedited permitting process. The council's proposed limits would remove mining as a covered sector and limiting eligibility to just critical mineral projects. What does that mean? That means that copper mines would be ineligible despite a critical material uh, being a critical material according to the Secretary of Energy. So I, I'm, how can this happen just after the report that was put out that said mining is critical to our future and our needs? Uh, can you address what is happening? It seems like the administration, even though they have this all-government approach, many pillars of it are not talking to one another. And in, I, I don't know if you have a response, Mr. Boudreaux, but I would sure love to hear one. Yeah, no, thanks very much. I do have a response. I actually participated in a FIPSI meeting yesterday where um, talked about specifically this issue. Um, and so um, on the one hand, the proposal to include um, mining as a covered activity under FAST 41 I think is very positive. Uh, and that's what it is. It's a proposal to do that. Um, it is a draft. Uh, and we are having exactly that conversation about whether um, uh, these sort of um, parameters around qualification are the appropriate ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do hear you on that. Uh, and it's an active conversation and one that uh, I will carry forward into the steering council. Thank you. And let me put one other thing out there, because I know um, the new proposal specifically identifies USGS critical mineral list for uh, utilization. But uh, unless I'm wrong, Department of Energy and the Department of Defense have their own lists of strategic and critical materials that are central to our energy and national security that include more minerals that are on that USGS critical mineral list. So how is that? Hopefully there is a coordination around these so that all of the agencies are, are, are working together as well and not limiting access to these essential minerals that we need. Yeah. So I think part of um, the complexity there is distinctions between, you know, energy-related minerals and um, and other types of minerals. Uh, so, for example, on the USGS list, they don't include, you know, uranium, plutonium, et cetera. Um, I agree with you that um, having a multitude of lists about what's critical and applying, you know, that adjective uh, creates a lot of confusion. And so uh, I do think, you know, bringing... Um, perspective into um, uh, sourcing as opposed to whether you're on the list or off the list uh, makes sense. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, Mr. Compton, I only have a, a few uh, seconds left, but I, I have a couple of questions with respect to the Interagency Working Group Mining Reform Report. You touched on, one, the distinction between the claim location system uh, and the leasing system. Um, can you talk about also the the seven cents per ton tax on moving unprocessed ore? Because it may sound good, but what does it actually mean in practical um, uh, implementation? Thank you for the question. Um, in all due respect, I'm not sure that it even sounds good. <laughs> uh, you know, we we affectionately or maybe not so affectionately refer to that as a dirt tax. Uh, there really is no explanation for why there would be a tax just for moving dirt or how many times that 
dirt movement is taxed. I mean, because you move, uh, you move over burden several times throughout a mining process. So uh, seven cents per ton may sound like a minuscule amount, uh, but when you consider the massive amounts of, of earth that is needed to move to under, uncover some of these deposits, uh, we have estimated that it would cost several hundred million dollars per year uh, to the mining industry, much of which obviously would be in Nevada. And moving dirt is not unique, uh, or excuse me, is, is, is part of the hard rock mining process, isn't that correct? You, you cannot uh, right. unearth these deposits without yeah. it, yeah. Thank you, my time is up, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, and I agree wholeheartedly with you, Senator. I can't believe I'm saying this because Senator, it's Senator Hoven's turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Early. I came early because it was uh, Cassidy's birthday. I'm sure he's pleased he stayed and listened and, to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> isn't he, Governor? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Secretary Boudreaux, um, thanks for being here. Uh, we appreciate your willingness to come out to North Dakota as you have and, and look forward to having you out there again. I um, think it's very important for you to get out on the ground. So. Appreciate you doing that. In the uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act, we set timelines on EAs and, and EISs. One year on an EA, two year on an EIS. How are you coming with uh, getting that uh, implemented? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I do look forward to uh, next time I get to visit North Dakota. The um, We've established, and in, in fact, you know, components of this uh, brought forward from the previous administration, a review process by which um, at my level in the department, we track uh, NEPA documents, uh, both for uh, content and quality, but also timing. And it is through that process that we're implementing the timing requirements uh, under uh, this year's legislation. Yeah, that's gonna be really important. I mean. We've got to bring certainty, to, just listening to all three, we've got to bring certainty to this process, and that's an effort to do it. And I believe simplicity is really important. Is, you know, we talk about permitting reform, pretty soon it gets so confused, confusing, and then everybody has their own interpretations. And that's why we push for that kind of simple uh, regulatory requirement, you know, the, the one year and the two year time frame. So I, I think that's really important if we're gonna get after these critical minerals like I think we all want to. Would you agree with that? I agree. Um, the only addition I would make to it is, at the end of the day, these are the documents we get sued on. Uh, and so I am very focused always on quality. Uh, and so schedule, um, you know, certainty on timeline is essential, but nothing throws a project off like protracted litigation. And so the quality has to be there as well. Right, precisely where I'm going. I, I think it was you, Dr. Jurgen, that mentioned judicial review and how that is slowing us down. This goes to what uh, Mr. Compton was talking about, where in Australia or Canada it's taking, what, two or three years to get these things permitted, and here it's uh, seven to 10. Uh, in our state, you know, with, uh, and, and somebody else uh, mentioned the, uh, uh, you know, the, the plays like the, the shale plays. And in the Bakken, you know, we went from less than 100,000 barrel a day of oil production to 1.5 million a day at peak, but we put the right legal tax and regulatory framework in place to do it. And so we've got to do that for, criminal, for uh, critical minerals. So to you, Dr. Jurgen, and then you, Mr. Compton, how do we get, including judicial review, how do we get that legal tax regulatory structure in place what's it going to take or we're not going to get after these critical minerals and we're going to be dependent on places like china right i mean isn't that really what it comes down to i, I think that's right and i mean at the end of the day nothing happens if you don't have capital that's invested and people are not going to invest capital if they if there's that high degree of uncertainty i mean i was so even if if secretary Baudreau gets those things implemented and we knock that down to say a two year or three year time frame like Canada, Australia, if you get tied up in court for the next seven, it's still 10 years, isn't it? That's right. I mean, yeah, so uh, I don't know what you do about the judicial review side of it, but it, it, it isn't just the permitting, it's what goes on after that and stage after stage after stage. And some of you know very well how some of these projects just go on as judicial review. Point is we have to do both if we're gonna yeah. get this done. Yes. 
uh, Mr. Compton. Yeah, thank you, Senator. If I could jump in on that too. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Litigation reform, I think, is a needs to be a central component of further permitting talks, uh, and, I, and I'm confident that 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 is going to be part of, of uh, further meaningful permitting reform. But I, I can give you several ideas uh, to include in that as well. You know, the, the 2020 NEPA regulations uh, put in place by the prior administration actually contain some very helpful mm. mitigation reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, those have been rolled back. Uh, but uh, some things that uh, that could be done legislatively, you know, lowering the, the statute of limitations. Uh, well, isn't that it? We almost have to do it legislatively because otherwise new regulations get put in place that defeat the, the whole effort. Yes, it, it certainly needs to be in statute. Uh, you know, limiting the, the agency's time to act on remand would be helpful. So it's instructive if we actually want to develop the mining here in this country, we better get after it statutorily or we're going to be subject to more regulatory burden that's going to stop it in its tracks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to just put this hearing in, in a little bit of perspective. Um, we're not talking about rolling back mining regulations or shortening statute of limitations in order to have somebody make more money, we're trying to beat climate change. And we're in a race, and it's a, a race in a matter of months and years. The, I just heard on the radio this morning that glaciers in Switzerland have declined 10% in the last two years. That's astounding if you think about that. These are glaciers that have been there for thousands of years. So we have to, this is an urgent environmental priority. And it strikes me that one of the problems is that we're um, we're treating this as a, as sort of environmental growth or, or environmental protection. Green energy is over here, and permitting reform is over here, and they're not related. They're intimately related. Uh, for example, one of the things we haven't talked about today is, is grid access. Uh, we have environmental projects, wind and solar projects, that can't get on the grid because of the inadequacy of the grid. Well, that means there's going to have to be transmission. I was at a meeting last week on transmission there are three major transmission projects in the West, the shortest of which has been at it 21 years. From the time of the inception of the project to the time it's going to go online, the longer I think is about 25 years. That's another example of exactly what we're talking about. So I guess uh, what I would like, and perhaps we could take this for the record, is some specificity about what makes it take 14 years to do a mine. In other words, how much is NEPA, how much is local permitting, how much is state, how much is, is litigation? Do, do you see what I'm asking, Mr. Compton? I, it would help us, I think, if we knew exactly where the bottlenecks were, and then we can move to try to address them. Uh, by the way, the comment about litigation reminded me of Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, uh, Dickens' famous case in, in Bleak House, where the lawyers passed the litigation on from generation to generation. Uh, you said half of a person's life could be spent permitting one, one project. Um, how about the role of state and local permitting? Uh, because we're all talking about federal permitting and, and NEPA, but isn't sta aren't state and local permitting issues also at stake here, Mr. Compton? They absolutely are, and, and we need better coordination between federal and state and local permitting and being able to uh, when one or the other has uh, completed analysis uh, for the others to be able to use that that analysis. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, if we are truly going to tackle climate change, we have to get serious about this now. And to your, to your point about the, the various phases of mining and the, in the mining life cycle, every, every bit of those phases need to be constricted. You know, exploration can take up to 10 years or more before we even get to the start of permitting. Having the USGS doing additional research and mapping can and sharing that information with mining companies can help shorten that period of time. That's a, that's a good example. I mean, I think what we need is a little bit of urgency on this issue because we are in a race with, with the, the uh, uh, warming climate and the effects, the catastrophic effects that's going to have on us. And uh, we, we, it, it just can't be the sort of plodding, oh, it takes a long time to do a, to a transmission project. 
Um, let me change the subject a bit from mining. Uh, what about processing? There's a, a major produ production of lithium in Australia, which is a pretty friendly country, but 85% of the processing is in China. Do the permitting delays we're talking about here also apply to processing? Because that's where uh, it seems to me we, we, we need to be discussing that as well as getting the material out of the ground. Processing is, is it, it's no good unless it's processed. Mr. Jurgen, talk to me about processing. Yeah, that, um, I mean, processing is a, uh, often is a very intense uh, and in China, you know, pretty environmentally uh, heavy pro uh, activity to do that. And so, you know, we used to have, I think, 12 copper smelters in the United States. I think we're down to two now. I think it would be pretty hard uh, to actually uh, build a new copper smelter and also go through the permitting of, of that. So it's not just the mining that we need to think about, but the, you know, the real choke point on the minerals beyond, beyond mining is where the processing is. And uh, that's, you know, it doesn't get as much attention, but also needs to be looked at really carefully. Just I do think physically what's involved in building this and are people willing to commit the capital to do it? I do think that's uh, an important subject that we should be talking about, Mr. Chairman, is processing as well as, as extraction. Uh, finally, I, I want to submit for the record an article by Bill McKibben uh, in Mother Jones, where the title of the article says a lot about what the article says. It's called Yes in My Backyard. And it's Bill McKibben's account of his journey from a strong environmental activist whose primary job was to stop things to the realization that in order to achieve a green energy future, we need to build things. And that you can't, this is me, not Bill McKibben, you can't love EVs and hate lithium. And you can't love uh, you, you can't love solar and wind projects and hate transmission. Uh, this is absolutely a part of it. And what bothers me sometimes is that you'll have 100 units of environmental benefit from a project and eight units of environmental detriment, and it doesn't get built. And you're missing, we're missing an environment, a major environmental benefit. So thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great hearing, uh, great, uh, great panel. Thank you for this. You know, we've all recognized that uh, when it comes to, to to minerals, we can't we can't define or pick where the location is. The location is where they are, and so often uh, part of the challenge as we're trying to access minerals is how do we access them. Um, how do we get them to the processing facilities? And, and in Alaska, of course, we're particularly challenged because of, of our vast distances. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a community in the interior of Alaska, Fairbanks. You're probably not going to find a more pro-mining community, but that community is divided right down the middle right now. Um, because there is a very significant mining prospect about 250 miles from Fairbanks, and they're moving forward. There will be great benefits to the native village that is situated nearby, um, but they're going to be trucking that, that, uh, that rock 240 miles um, to another mine site for the processing, and it's the access that has really confounded folks, and as I've shared with some um, in the administration. I read articles where here uh, in the Biden administration, um, we are proposing to send a couple, well, $150 million um, working with an, Aust an Australian mining company for uh, a mine in Africa and to help advance that mine. Uh, we're putting forward $250 million to help uh, advance a, a rail line uh, to, to Tidewater to help facilitate that. Um, I can tell you the people of Interior would certainly appreciate some assistance from our own government with how we might be able to, to do a rail extension to get those resources uh, more safely out. Um, we have other mining projects, and the Deputy Secretary and I have had multiple conversations about Ambler, uh, again, a very lucrative and prospective uh, mineral deposit in the interior of the state, but in order to access it, it will require uh, a mine of, of several hundred miles, and uh, that has faced its own challenges. So, Deputy Secretary, I'd, I'd like to ask you for the record, um, just for uh, a confirmation here on the Ambler project, 
uh, when we had Secretary Holland before this committee, May 16th of 2023, and I asked her when we should expect to see the record of decision finalized. Uh, she indicated, she said, yes, the ROD by 2023, that continues to be the plan. Then a few days later, on May 19th, uh, we have a DOJ attorney submit to the U.S. District Court, uh, a court-ordered update, uh, now claims that a final SES, SEIS is not anticipated until 2024, not expected to be signed until the second quarter of 2024. So again, Alaskans want to know, you know, you're talking about how we're going to do a better job of expedited permitting. Uh, that's what this uh, working group was kind of designed to do, and yet, um, in, in a matter of four days, we see a six-month slippage. So for the record, if you can just share um, where we are with the record of decision on Ambler. Uh, thanks very much. We'll be publishing the drafts on the panel. Uh, do not ask further. Uh, uh, and we're still uh, on that timeline to uh, complete the consultation with the uh, district court. Issue a record of decision um, in the second quarter of next year. The second quarter of 24. So. What the secretary stated before the committee that it would be the end of 23 is not accurate. It is now second quarter 24. The schedule that we, the updated schedule we submitted in the litigation, which is why we have to do the supplemental analysis, um, is still the schedule that we're, uh, we're on. Let me ask about the uh, department's interagency working group. Uh, the chairman has, has raised that, and apparently um, there's a little bit of back and forth in terms of, of what has been produced by, by this report. Um, the, the report acknowledges its requirements under the infrastructure bill, but when you, when you parse through the, the pages of it, 169 pages, it's tough to find where the report actually addresses many of the issues that are that are required by the law, um, whether it's the, the the period of time that is typically required to complete each step, um, uh, the processing of applications, operating plans, leases, license permits, and so. I think we were pretty clear in the infrastructure bill that this is what we expected. We didn't just expect a report saying uh, this is this is. Uh, this is in response to, to your query, but we actually asked for, for some time frames for these activities. So can you give me um, uh, some more clarity on the time frames and, and kind of what, what the department is doing to address some of these data gaps? Uh, yeah, and happy to have follow-up conversation Good. on all of that, uh, those questions. Uh, fundamentally, one of the challenges we have, which is uh, the reason why um, one of the core recommendations is a leasing program, understanding that um, a lot would have to be thought through for a program like that, um, is we don't have a lot of control over the process. We don't have control over when we uh, can expect to receive a mine plan of operations. We don't have control over um, uh, diligence requirements, uh, et cetera, that um, we do have in other contexts, including oil and gas, uh, including renewable energy. And so part of what I would like to see is a permitting structure that can hold us accountable, but also hold uh, operators accountable for responsible development. And I'll just note that uh, anyone who thinks Canada is the perfect model for this activity should talk to Senator Murkowski. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. We do have a, a couple little issues there. Mr. Chairman. Um, acting chair. Okay, Mr. Acting Chairman, I'll, I'll direct to you. Um, I, I would like to do some follow-on with regards to the working group, but I was going to ask Dr. Jurgen, my time has expired, but the, the big question here is how we move the needle now. We're all talking about the urgency. We, we can talk about it's going to be 35% more, it's two times more, it's 17 times more. The urgency is clearly there. We, we recognize that. And yet we're, 
we're not moving the needle like we need to. And we can say we've got to legislate on the permitting side and we have to do that, but we have to recognize that we've got litigation that we have to deal with. But we also have this issue of social license to operate. And that kind of drives the litigation piece of it. And in fairness, it influences the politics on the, on the, uh, on the permitting side and all that goes on there. And so uh, I don't want it Senator, a good question could, could for the defer, record. But can you defer the answer until we let our two yeah. remaining No, no, no. I, I'm not going to ask the question. I'm just going to put it out there because uh, I would like somebody else to <laughs> answer that or to ask that because I'm going to be waiting around because the conversation is just too good. Thank you. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Juergen. Um, so we have a few companies uh, in Arizona. One, one in particular is a business called Urbix that does uh, processing of graphite. And I'm concerned that some of the um, joint ventures that are currently being formed in some of these free trade jurisdictions with Chinese partners are skirting the intent of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's potentially subsidizing our competitors instead of helping businesses like the one I mentioned, uh, Urbix, who is uh, in Maricopa County, who processes graphite. So Dr. Jurgen, have you seen these joint ventures? Um, like, what do you know about them, and what impact do you expect that they have on U.S. domestic jobs and U.S. production? Well, I haven't, you know, studied them in detail, but the fact is that, you know, the reality was that until about 20, 2019, 2020, people just were not paying attention much to this issue at all. And the way that the industry developed is globally is with China being a very important, you know, important, uh, a predominant player. And so I think the reality is that those entities exist. I don't know whether the specific ones are competing with your the companies that you're you're talking about, but this is this issue of of uh, of critical minerals is so entangled with our changing relationships with China, and they're not what they were four or five years ago, and it's not going to get easily untangled at this point. But you can try and you know shift continue to shift the balance, which is what your the recent legislation is aiming to do. Yeah, we've heard that. Uh, you know, as Urbix and companies like them you know, try to sign contracts, um, it's often challenging mm -hmm. because of, um, you know, the joint ventures that exist in these free trade jurisdictions. Right. Um, so it, it does need to be addressed, and we've got to get this back on track. Um, Mr. Compton, so Arizona's uh, leading the way in resource development uh, that's going to help power this clean ener energy economy for decades. And the first and only mine in the Fast 41 process is a mine called South 32 Hermosa Project. It's in uh, Santa Cruz County. And this is the only domestic advanced mine development project that can produce two critical minerals, uh, zinc and manganese. So Mr. Compton, I'm sure many of your members are watching this Fast 41 process closely. And what outcomes uh, do you feel will make the process more appealing to your members? Well, thank you for that question, Senator. Yes, uh, actually South 32 and their, their Hermosa project is a member of ours as well. And so we've been watching that very closely and as I'm sure many of our members are. You know, we were very pleased uh, to have mining added as a covered sector a couple of years ago. As you know, the, the, the Hermosa project is the first one to be on the, the permitting dashboard. You know, I, ultimately, the, the whole FAST 41 process was implemented to permit large infrastructure projects in a more timely manner. And so that's what we need to see out of this process is expedited permitting, and doing so, by the way, in a way that does not take, uh, you know, short shrift to our environmental regulations. And so one of the things for me is if we can do it for these large infrastructure projects without shortchanging our environmental laws and regulations, why can't we do that for all projects? 
-hmm. So that's why it, it you know, the, the, the process where with Fast 41, with more transparency, better agency coordination, it's all things that we need in permitting for all projects. That's why it was frustrating. This came up a little earlier in the hearing uh, that FIPSI last week proposed to now limit the mining projects that would be available under FAST 41 to only those designated as critical mineral projects. Yeah, I understand that the Hermosa project is, and that's great, but we've got an awful lot of projects out there that may not be necessarily deemed critical according to the USGS, but I would submit that the entire periodic table is critical. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now we have Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Boudreau, let me start with you. Are you aware that there is currently a strike going on nationwide by auto workers in this country? I'm aware of the auto worker strike. Yeah. So I just returned from my home state of Missouri. We're in Winsville, Missouri. That's right outside St. Louis. About 4,000 workers are striking. I was on the picket line with them on Monday talking to them about their concerns, what it is they hope for for their future. I talked to folks who were as young as 20 and had been there for a couple of months and uh, folks who, were as, who had been there for 40 years and were nearing retirement. And one thing I heard consistently is they're worried about the future of their jobs. You know, the younger workers, are there going to be, is there going to be a lot of working jobs in this country after this administration finishes forcing the auto industry into an electric vehicle production that is made predominantly overseas. I'm sure you know where most electric vehicles are made in, in the world. It is an enormous priority for the administration, part of the reason why the president himself joined auto workers in the strike to demand Where are most where 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 are most of where are fifty four percent of electric vehicles made globally? The entire point of uh, where are fifty four percent of electric vehicles made globally? The whole point is. No, I'm, I'm asking you a question. Where are 54 percent of electric vehicles made globally? I don't. You don't know. I don't know about that number. I know that the answer the is point, the answer is China. Where is the, the critical? Is, well, wait, wait, hold on a minute. Here. Hold on a minute. Where is 73 percent of cobalt refining? Where does it take place globally? Overseas. Where specifically? Probably China. Yeah, China. Where is most cobalt mining performed? Who owns most of the cobalt, cobalt mines in the world? Probably most of that sourcing is in Africa. China has the majority. 77% of electric vehicle cathodes are made in China. 92% of anodes are made in China. 66% of battery cells are assembled in China. The New York Times recently did a report on this. The New York Times is not a notably right-wing publication. They said, can the world make an electric car battery without China? Their conclusion, the only winner so far is China. My question is, why would we want to make our auto industry dependent on supply chains in China? Why is that a good idea? We don't. Then why are you doing it? The entire point of this conversation, the entire point of this hearing, is to domesticate and make more reliable the sourcing of the materials. To then why are you shutting? Energy. Why are you shutting down critical mining in the United States? We're not. The you are. Why did you close the twin metals mine in this country earlier this year? Two hundred and twenty-five thousand acres in Minnesota, which mines critical minerals like copper, nickel, cobalt. Again, the entire point of this conversation is to do mining in a responsible way that also reconciles with... In a responsible way. Do, do, first of all, answer my question. Why did you close the Twin Metals mine? Because of the threat to the Boundary Waters, which is one of the largest economic drivers in Minnesota. So you think that we shouldn't have critical supply chains in the United States, jobs good-paying jobs with labor protections in the United States? Not at the expense of one of the richest fish, fisheries in the United States and the world, such as in Alaska and the Pebble Mine. Not at the, the Twin Metals Mine isn't in Alaska. It's in it Minnesota. Is, it's 225,000 acres in Minnesota. Correct. And my point is, uh, as we look to accelerate the development of domestic critical mineral mining, we have to do it in a way that does not 
uh, conflict with and deplete other important aspects of the economy. In northern Minnesota, that includes the recreation economy and the boundary waters, which is uh, one of the main drivers of tourism. So you're, you're going to prioritize recreation over good-paying jobs here in this country for mining? You're going to withdraw this mine that has been online and now shudder it? The number of jobs generated by the boundary waters and tourism uh, dramatically uh, outpaces the potential of that mine. I thought it was critical that we had supply chains in this country, and yet you're shutting down critical mineral production in this country. Do you know instead what that's making us reliant on? Do you know what China's labor practices are? For instance, at their cobalt mine in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, have you seen the reporting on this? You'll get no argument for me that uh, domestic sourcing... They use child labor is the answer to my question. Child labor. In uh, harrowing conditions. And also religion. China uses Uyghur labor, yes. slave yes, labor. They yes, they do. And yet, you are making us dependent on imports from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, controlled by China, from Chinese-controlled and owned mines all across the world. You're shutting down our mines here in the United States. Well, we disagree about all of that. Would you support? Well, facts are facts, and sometimes they're tough. But what's going to be really tough is when we don't have any auto jobs left in this country because you've shipped them all overseas. When we can't mine anything in this country because you're shutting it all down. And we all know why. It's in pursuit of your radical environmentalist agenda. That's the real answer Senator, here. Your time is up. Uh, let me just say this, Senator, that uh, first of all, the Twin Metals Project has never operated. It's never been operational. You know, Senator, with due respect, I've sat here and listened to my colleagues who went two and three minutes over. So I've been very well, patient. I think I'm the last person to question. Maybe it's okay, Senator well, Lee. Senator Lee's waiting for you. Okay. Well, you I'd be, I'd be happy to... second round? That'd be second fine. Round? I'll sit here. I'm, I'm happy to do sure. it. I'm we're sure you'll here. give me some time. We're not here to berate. We're basically here to try to get information how to do it. We've passed legislation, which I don't think you voted for, that gave us more dependencies as far as... Senator, I'm here to ask questions and to get answers. Well, you're here to... It's demagoguery. I mean, you're basically attacking every witness we have. You always have. I'm sorry. We just disagree, okay? I'll come back to you. Senator Lee. Mr. Boudreau, thank you for being here today. I, I want to get to some issues about mining here in just a moment, but bef uh, before I do that, I need to ask you very quickly about a couple of things. Uh, first, about Interior's contingency plan for the potential government shutdown this weekend. I'm, uh, I'm frustrated, uh, surprised, upset, if not angry, uh, that, that Interior still hasn't published its plan for the national parks. Um, it, you know, Communities um, rely on that plan uh, for what will potentially happen here in just a few days if the government shuts down. Communities surrounding our national parks units, and uh, that's important. So you must understand the huge economic impact that shutting down national parks would have on individuals and communities across the country, uh, but especially in Utah where we have a lot of national park units. Um, so just yes or no, because I don't have a whole lot of time here. Does the interior department plan to keep national park units open in the event of a shutdown? Um, so to answer the question, uh, I spoke with Governor Cox this morning. I spoke with Governor um, Gordon last night from Wyoming. Um, we w are aware of the potential for a shutdown. Obviously, the best thing that could happen is uh, not to shut down the government, sure. not to shut down our parks. Um, but we will uh, work with the state of Utah, as we always have, to ensure that uh, we minimize that type of economic disruption. Okay, and there I are mechanisms that. to do that. I appreciate that, and you know, I appreciate you reaching out to Governor Cox uh, around that. Um, uh, we do have plenty of ways to do this. As I pointed out to um, a letter that I sent to Secretary Holland just a few days ago, uh, you should be designating as essential as many park and land management employees as possible and using FLORIA fee revenues to fund essential operations. Unfortunately, it sounds like some states including Utah, may be forced yet again to use state funds to keep our national parks open. We're grateful to have lots of national parks in Utah. Uh, it's one of the things that goes along with that. I introduced legislation this week to make sure that these states that utilize state resources to keep those open in the event of a shutdown and in the event that you decide to shut down the park units, um, to make sure that those states are repaid by the federal government in, in a timely manner, just as we repay in a timely manner federal workers furloughed during a shutdown. Uh, yes or no, will Interior support that effort on that bill? Uh, again, 
the best thing that could possibly happen is that we avoid this um, by avoiding a shutdown. Uh, and I know folks in the Senate are working very hard okay. in that way. I, I, I don't have any pending legislation in front of me on that. I think there is a history of that type of legislation, however. Okay, I'd ask you to take a look at that. My hope uh, and my request is that you not oppose it. Now, let's talk about the recent decision by Interior to lock up 960,000 acres in northern Arizona, uh, a, a shameless abuse of, of the Antiquities Act. This land contains the purest uranium deposits in North America, a, a critical fuel for nuclear power, uh, which in turn uh, is going to be vital for the objective of achieving a so-called carbon-free uh, carbon future. But instead of accessing our pure reserves here at home, the Biden administration would rather apparently have us be completely dependent on Russia which supplies almost half of our enriched uranium supply today. Mr. Petro, do you realize, uh, do, do you really believe that restricting and blocking up access to highly mineralized federal lands in the U.S. will help counter Russian and Chinese control of mineral supply chains? So the example you're pointing to, are, I think, really highlights the challenge we have in this space. So the example you're pointing to is the recent national monument designated by President Biden uh, to protect the watershed around the Grand Canyon, one of the most I iconic places in the world, one of the most important national parks outside of Utah. <laughs> um, and it was a monument proposal sponsored by a coalition of tribes, which have borne the brunt of uranium development and other types of mineral development. And so those are exactly the types of issues that uh, in order to consistent with what Senator Hawley is advocating for, uh, centralize and make more sound uh, supply chains in the United States, we have to deal with. We, we do have to deal with it, but you have a whole lot more to deal with now that you've abused the Antiquities Act yet again in this manner. It baffles me, absolutely baffles me, that the Biden administration, on one hand, thinks it can magically change the weather by pushing for a, a, a rapid energy transition where the United States uh, becomes a green wonderland full of solar panels and big batteries and everyone drives around in a $60,000 SUV. But then, on the other hand, at the very same time, you're doing everything you can to lock up uranium in Arizona, nickel in Minnesota, copper in Alaska, thinking that if you stop mining from happening here in the U.S. and, and leave it to the child laborers in Congo, you'll have magically saved the climate and the planet. This madness needs to stop. Thank you, Senator. And we're going to go with our second round. Let me just say this to Senator Hawley. I'm sorry if you believe I've been differential. But on that, I know our busy, the busy schedules you have and other different committees, everything that you are saying, we feel the same. And it's been bipartisan on both sides. I'm going to go to Senator Murkowski first for her second round and come right back to but That's fine, Mr. Chairman. I just say this, though. Let's not, don't characterize my questions as demagoguery when I'm trying to get answers. Sir, we've had people in front of here up at this committee. We've been through this because everybody basically has asked the same questions you were on that. Senator, you don't get to control what questions I ask or don't ask. No, and no, quite no, frankly, I think what you're doing is abusive. We've, we've been and I'm going to call you out on it. Okay? Oh, I'm going to call you out many times too. Well, that's fine. That's not a problem, but I'm in chairman right now and you're out of order. Senator Murkowski. Mr. Chairman. This is a committee that um, historically, I've been on this committee now for 20 years, maybe 21, I don't know. Um, but we are a committee that I think has been viewed um, both internally here in the Senate and externally as a committee that really likes to fo focus on policy. We really like to focus on the hard things because there are hard things when it comes to how, how we power, how we move our, our country. Um, how we can be competitive. And so I think the good debate, the hard questions are good, are fair. Um, and I would just encourage all of us that how, how we approach our questions, um, uh, there's, there's a level of respect that comes with all of it. If we were really trying to get answers to the hard questions, it's how, it's how we treat one another, how we treat our witnesses with respect and, and how we really try to, to get good value from this. Um, I want to go back to the question 
that I asked, and I do apologize, Senator Hawley, because I had gone over my time. And I, th well, I think we kind of took advantage of the fact that the chairman was not in his chair at that time. Um, uh, that's my bad. But I really do want to know the answer, and it may not be answerable, but Dr. Jurgen, you, you, um, you have more expertise in these areas than anybody I know. You have seen us move from a country of vulnerability, great vulnerability and exposure when it came to our oil resources to figuring out how we then become that, that lead country, um, exercising that um, extraordinarily global position where we can influence what goes on with the markets. Um, we have a role that um, we should be proud of in this country, and we should all, Republicans and Democrats, I don't care what administration you're part of, should want to try to encourage and continue. And unfortunately, with critical minerals, it's a little bit of deja vu all over again. We can see ourselves getting trapped in that same place where we have the resource here, but for a multitude of different reasons, uh, far too often, it it's just comes down to the politics of it. We, we lock it off from ourselves. We make ourselves vulnerable on others. And that's a dangerous place to be, particularly at a time when we see China eating our lunch in many of these areas, when it comes to the ability to process, um, really when it comes to, uh, to, to mining in places where and I agree with you, Deputy Secretary, there are places that we should not be mining. I think we know that. But we also know that we do it better, safer, cleaner here in this country. So let's figure out how we make it happen, as we did with oil, the success that fracking brought. So I raised the question. You've heard it already. Um, we, we stall ourselves out by permitting um, issues that we haven't been able to get on top of. And despite what we did in the... Um, uh, in the last measure where we said, okay, we're going to put some timelines here on, on, on EAs. That's not enough. It's, it's not enough. And if we think that, that that's good enough, we're fooling ourselves. Um, the litigation piece of it is, is you, you talk to anybody that's trying to develop oil, gas, minerals, they are baking litigation time into their project planning, into their base budget. It is a reality that is just awful. But so much of that then comes from you got to get the social license to operate. So we're talking about it all the time. Are we just talking to ourselves? Why can't we get, why can't we get people in this country, young people particularly, to get what Senator King was pointing to? was that the environmental considerations here are equally important. What do we have to do? I guess I'm asking you to be the marketing man here. Well, I think that's a pretty big question. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, you know, I think it's a question I was thinking as you're, as you're, as you're pointing this out, it's late to the party. I mean, in, until a few years ago, mining was something that did not attract capital, was not very interesting in the United States. It's really changed because of the discussion about energy transition and EVs, but also because of the geopolitics. So it's really a, an effort of catching up. And I think it is, uh, it is a communications thing to understand that, you know, as the IMF, as I quoted at the beginning, says you're not going to have the energy transition if you don't have the minerals. And that's a, just a fundamental factor. And I think. But we have the minerals. Yeah. yeah. We just need to access them. Yeah. And I think it was, it was interesting that I think Senator Hoven mentioned the seven to 10, you know, that the delays. That actually comes from a study that one of our predecessor companies did in 2015. I think it's really time that we've got to really look at that again, because I suspect that it's actually a longer time frame now. But I think this committee and what you're doing is trying to, is is reversing it. But it's just something that's not going to happen overnight. And mining is a uh, long time horizon industry. Thank you, sir. Senator Hawley. Hmm. Mr. Boudreaux, let's come back to the question of the Congo that we were talking about. So if you are opposed to the child labor practices of China and the Congo, will you support the legislation introduced by some of our colleagues in the House 
that would prohibit all imports of cobalt mined using child or forced labor. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that legislation. Senator Boudreaux, uh, if you could put your microphone so we can just put it over towards you, because I think, oh, there you go, like that. Okay. I'm not familiar with that legislation. Um, I do agree with you that those types of practices are practices that uh, we need to uh, eliminate from our sourcing of critical minerals. So you would support a, a prohibition, you would support a, a ban on imports in principle of any of these critical minerals that have been mined using child labor? No, I support um, working hard to transition away from sources that uh, use those types of practices. Well, wh why not ban it? Why not say we're, if, it's, if it's got child labor in the supply chain, we're not going to import it in this country. I we're think not going to have massive child... implications. Wait, I'm not done yet. We're not going to we're not going to prop up child labor in this country or fund it. I think an abrupt ban would again. I haven't studied this issue. Um, one of the questions I would ask in connection with a ban like that would be what the impacts, including economic disruption, of such a ban would be. Well, the impact would make slave labor and child labor extremely expensive. It would make American labor a lot more attractive. That's what it would do. It would incentivize jobs with labor protections in this country. Shouldn't we want that? Again, I haven't reviewed that legislation. I don't know what the impacts of it would be. I agree with you that um, getting reliable sourcing that does not uh, associate with those types of practices should be the goal of the United States. But you can't agree that we should ban it. Again, I haven't studied the legislation. It's hard for me. Well, to then, what? That I guess let me, let me just ask you a broader question. What steps are you taking to decouple American mineral production from slave labor? Then. Uh, slave labor is completely illegal in the United States, has been since the 19th century. And so the uh, domestic sourcing in the United States um, is uh, preferable over um, activities like you're describing in the Congo. But, but, yeah, yeah, obviously. But, but our, we are reliant, as you and I talked about in our first round of questioning, we are heavily reliant on supply chains that is shot through with slave labor and child labor in China, in the Congo, elsewhere. So my question is, what are you doing to decouple us from those supply chains? You won't support a ban on child labor, so, so, so what do you propose then? This was the purpose of the interagency working group that I chaired. This is the entire thrust of the report that we issued earlier this month, is how do we increase the uh, reliable sourcing of these materials uh, I think Dr. Jurgen makes an excellent point about refining as well um, uh, to decouple, again, our reliance on, um, on sources that uh, involve practices that uh, are important to us. Well, all I can say is I don't know why it makes any sense to be shutting down critical mineral supply chains in this country, shutting down mines in this country, mandating further reliance on China and other overseas supply chains that are dependent on slave labor and child labor, while workers in our country are facing the loss of their jobs. I think it's just crazy, to be honest with you. I think it's just crazy. And Mr. Chairman, I have to say in conclusion, you may not like my questions, but I'm going to keep asking them. I made a commitment to the people of my state. I'm going to come right here. I'm going to be a bulldog. I'm going to ask the questions, and you can interrupt me as much as you want, cut me off, take my time away, but I promise um, I you never, I'm not going to stop. I would never do Let me just tell you one thing. I agree with what you're saying. I just don't like the way you say it. How's that? That's your right, but you know we what? Have a difference. I'm, I'm, we, we I'm have going a to keep on keeping on. Here's the thing. We, we all agree. You, you know, If you'd have been able to be here, and I know because of other committee assignments, but we were going through all of these things. That was the only thing I got frustrated on. So with that being said, there's not a person here that doesn't understand. We are absolutely upset. This whole thing about the Congo, I've been speaking to people down there. It's horrible what's going on. They want to change. They're going to have our help. And I agree with you. We shouldn't accept any child labor. I'm on the bill, I think. But with all that being said, we've got to do more permitting here. We've got to do because basically we're allowing the EV, our whole EV dependency now, moving in that market quicker than what we can ever supply. And my whole reason to, to, to basically fight this administration is because I do not want to become dependent on our, basically, uh, our transportation mode on an unreliable supply chain. That's what will happen. I've waited for, I was old enough in 74, we talked about that, oil embargo. I had to wait in line to buy gas to go to work. 
I don't want to wait in line to buy a battery from China to go to work. So I agree. We're on the same path, I think. We just have a different way of approaching it. That's all. And that, I respect that. Okay, with that, we have uh, Professor Daines is going to explain to us exactly why we're messed up. I've been promoted to professor. Well, I'm Chairman. going to because I see you got a well, whole chart. Tell you I what. feel like I'm in a classroom now. Yeah, so I get to geek out from my old days of being a chemical engineer here today. So, uh, Chairman Manchin, thank you. Uh, behind me is the U.S. Geological Survey's most recent graph showing the United States mineral import reliance. And uh, this came, comes right out of the report, the U.S. Department of Interior, U.S. Geological Survey here, which is a really good report. I want everyone to take note of the highlighted portions that show, and I recognize it's an eye chart, but just to summarize it, uh, that look at everywhere it's highlighted, that's got Russia or China. So the yellow is China, the orange is Russia. Of the 65 minerals on that list, we rely on China or Russia for over half of them. That should be a wake-up call for all of us. I remember is I think everybody here is old from 1973. And we were going through, you know, anything think about the Jewish religious calendar, we just came through Yom Kippur. The war of Yom Kippur 1973 was a wake-up call to the world as it exposed the dependencies we had and kind of our single point of failure in the Middle East for oil. And of course, the Gulf of Hormuz, it was blockaded. We saw oil prices skyrocket and in fact those skyrocketing oil prices contributed to some of the inflationary pressures we saw that by 1981 a 30-year fixed mortgage was 18.6 percent what i'm concerned about is we are headed down a path where we could repeat the same mistakes that were made back in the 70s as we look forward in terms of a more renewable kind of economy more dependencies on um on electric, electricity as supply for, uh, for cars and so forth, that China and Russia become the OPEC of critical minerals. Simply put, we need to be mining more in the U.S. because what came out of the war of 19th century, the war of Yom Kippur, was a rallying cry. We need energy independence. And you know, we've been working on that now. Uh, in the United States to develop more made in America oil, gas, coal, to ensure we are decoupled from dependencies in terms of kind of the ultimate supply chain failure, and that is an energy supply chain failure. This could be another situation that faces us if we don't find ways to bring more of these critical mineral uh, the mining operations to the United States or to friendly countries. Deputy Secretary Boudreau, the Department of the Interior recently released their recommendations to reform mining. In it, you suggested raising taxes, lengthening the permitting process, withdrawing more land from development, and slapping a new royalty on mining operations. All these recommendations are not going to make it easier to mine domestically. It will make it harder. They will drive us further into dependence on China and Russia rather than promoting and incentivizing U.S. mineral independence. Um, Mr. Budo, do you agree that your recent recommendations are a step backward for mineral independence? And why would the department think that creating more costs and more regulatory hurdles for mining projects is the best idea when we are faced with the reality of Chinese and Russian mineral dominance? Uh, so the goal of the report and the recommendations in the report is to combat exactly um, the situation that your chart depicts. Um, in order to do that, um, there are fundamental things that have to be addressed. One is uh, the legacy and history of conflict that uh, the mining uh, activities in the United States uh, have posed for uh, communities across the United States. Some of that um, is reflected in the over uh, 500,000 abandoned hard rock mines that dot uh, the United States, especially in the American West. So any um, discussion about um, royalties 
uh, reflected in the report is meant to help address that. It's the same thing that we do with mine reclamation for the coal industry. It's the same thing we do with decommissioning and reclamation uh, with the oil and gas industry. And so, again, that is to build a sustainable um, uh, system for mining in the United States that has social license. Mr. Compton, um, one of the great things about democracy... He disagrees with me on right. some of that. Well, I was going to say, one of the great <laughs> things about democracy is we allow to have different points of view. And, and by the way, you know, I... Um, Mr. Buder, I, I have great respect for you and, and grateful what you do in Interior, and I'm a supporter of you and your nomination and, and glad you're where you're at. But I think we can also respectfully disagree. And uh, Mr. Yeah. Compton, uh, you may have a differing view, but uh, uh, what, what do you think? He and I have that same relationship, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, with all due respect to the Deputy Secretary, uh, I, I do disagree with him on the, the outcome or, or the proposed outcomes in the working group's report. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's... I, I think it's it's just consistent with what we have seen uh, from the administration. We we talk a really good game about securing our mineral supply chains, beginning with the president's uh, America Supply Chains Executive Order a month, uh, within a month of, of coming into office. All too often what we're seeing with actions on the ground, uh, they are decidedly anti-mining. And, you know, it's... I get where the Deputy Secretary is coming from uh, in changing the dynamic on, on how mining is conducted here. But we've done that. Uh, the industry has been committed for a long time to early and proactive engagement with stakeholders, communities, tribes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the the federal government through their formal consultation process can learn a lot from the mining industry. But we're never going to, as, as much as we are all for early engagement, we're never going to deconflict every mineral project. Uh, there are those out there um, that are just simply opposed to mining. Uh, it came up earlier, you know, yes in my backyard, but we got an awful lot of no in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the fact is that all the early engagement, I mean, we're all for that, but we're not going to deconflict this. We are still going to be facing litigation, and that's why I, I look forward to uh, additional permitting reforms from this committee uh, that can address that. Yeah. Mr. Thank Chairman, I know that, but just on the litigation form, I'll make a final comment. And um, I'm just glad Senator Hawley's not here. <laughs> uh, is you, you hit another topic here that I don't have time to continue the dialogue here, which I think has been thoughtful. But um, uh, we've been trying to get a copper mine permit in yeah. Montana for 30 years, and they've been through one of the EIS. I used to be an old Procter and Gamble uh, manager, and we used to make shampoo and mouthwash and toothpaste. It was lather, rinse, repeat. It's lather, rinse, repeat right now on, on the litigation because we're in the Ninth Circuit Court. And I think without, I know the chairman's been passionate as I am about permitting reform, and it's, it's badly needed. We're getting there. But, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's necessary, but I would argue not sufficient without litigation reform and a change and just more better balance in our course, particularly start with the Ninth Circuit. Senator, before you came, uh, before you were here, yeah. I know you had other other assignments, right. and, and uh, but we talked about that. And I, I brought the committee up to state that both our Republican uh, staff and our Democrat staff have been working very close, and we're getting we're getting agreement, and then we know where our challenges are, and we're going to try to overcome those to have something I think that both sides will be very pleased with and some per permitting reform. We're yeah. very hopeful for that. Well, and I, I just want to commend... Yeah, what you're saying right now, judicial right. reform is something that's very... It, 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 it is, because it, it becomes... That Article no. 3 jumps in here and suddenly uh, undercuts everything we've done. I mean, 30 years with state-of-the-art mining practices in Montana. You've got the Ninth District, I've got the Fourth... you got the Ninth Circuit, i got the Fourth. Yeah, we call it the Ninth yeah. Circus out there in Montana. Uh -huh. Chairman, okay. so anyway, thank you. Let me just say this to all of you. I, I, I think you know how how interesting this is and how essential it is for our country to move forward. Uh, I can always, uh, I, I can talk about the passion that people have for where we are going and what basically what we need for our country to be more self-reliant and not dependent on foreign supply chains. And I'm sorry for sometimes the, 
the dialogue and, and, and everything. I can't uh, speak to that. I can try to control it the best I can. But with that being said, we all have the same, I think, commitment and intent, both Democrats and Republicans, to be more self-reliant, not to be dependent, and basically make sure we can do what we can do. We can't ask other countries to do what we won't do for ourselves. That's the biggest. That is the biggest challenge that we have. And and hopefully we can get permit reform that that uh, uh, Secretary Boudreau that will help your agency give a clear pathway forward to what needs to be done and why we're behind you to get it done. And hopefully we can make that change. Uh, but with that being said, uh, I have a letter from the American Critical Minerals Association as well as a statement from the National Mining Association addressed to this committee. Uh, I'd like to enter into the record these two pieces of testimony without objection. I don't see any and I don't hear any. So both organizations, in the bipartisan efforts of the committee, recommend some common sense solutions such as permitting reform and highlight the need to act with urgency to address critical mineral supply chain. You all have been grateful and very helpful today and we're very grateful for that and I appreciate it. I know you made efforts to be here and I appreciate that more than you know. So the members are going to have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. And with that, meeting is adjourned.